In part one, Hassan and I talked about what it was like growing up as awkward, sensitive, so-called girly boys, struggling with being gay, and how we feel we dodged a massive bullet. In part two, we look at transitioning as an escape or rebirth, the dangers of gender, and which one of us, J.K. Rowling, likes better. Before we get into it, I'd like to invite you to become one of my Patreon supporters. You could be a beautiful stranger, a dancing queen, a sugar daddy, a fairy godmother, or a big spender. Or if you prefer, just like a one-off donation, you could use PayPal. It will help me to keep making these videos. Thank you so much. Okay, here's part two. Anyone who says that transing gay, the gay away is not a thing has yeah, no idea is, yeah. about how deep homophobia runs, yeah. especially internalized homophobia. Yeah, in ourselves at that time. And that can be such a driver to say, especially for these young ones who they haven't had any experiences, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so young. Um, they don't know what it's like to be mm. with someone, to fall in love with someone or, you know, in a positive way. Um, and for them at these, this young age, I mean, it's just a desire to, to escape. That to thought. think I, of the number of kids just at the Tavistock, Jits, mm -hmm. who've been put on these blockers. I mean, they, they put them on the blockers since when? And they lowered the age to 12. Mm. That was about 2014 or mm -hmm. some, somewhere around that time. How many? That's 10 years. Yeah. That's 10 years of putting kids who could have grown into. People been, like us. Like we so dodged a bullet. Yeah completely and that's as I was saying earlier that's what so many people gays and lesbians of our generation feel that my god we dodged a bullet here yeah because we could have been sucked into this yeah because I mean when we were young there were no school counselors no. who could have been trained by mermaids or gendered intelligence or yeah. done an all sorts it just workshop. wasn't a thing no and there was a, a when I went to secondary school when I was 12 there was a, an English teacher. She wasn't my teacher, mm -hmm. but for some reason she'd spotted me in the crowd of kids. And she asked for permission to every now and then take me out of the classroom mm -hmm. to have a chat with her. Yeah. Because she was training to be a child psychologist. Right. And I don't know what it was about me, but she yeah. just went Him. odd, maybe, or yeah. different. Let's have conversations. I was so insecure at the time, so I would always sit like this with my hands uh -huh. underneath my, my legs to try and make myself as small as possible. And I think one of her first questions was like, why do you sit like that? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, this is stupid. You're the adults, you tell me yeah. <laughs> I'm the child, yeah. duh. <laughs> but again, imagine if, if I had told her these things about the summer camp, mm -hmm. about kids calling me names and saying, you should have been a girl, about my twin being the tomboy, and me being so called into you know, girly stuff. With the narrative that we have today, even with all the stuff that's come out in the cast review, yeah. and you know that's only just come out, um, there's still so much catching up to do by, by the media who are pushing this narrative. If you say you're trans, you're trans. The trans, the whole myth of the trans child and the way that's mm -hmm. being pushed. Well, yeah, as I was saying earlier, I would, I'll never say a gay child. Right. And I, I, I'm horrified at the idea that people think that there are trans children, that children, you know, somehow have this sense of their gender, whatever the hell that is. Yeah, imagine saying, <coughs> here's my three-year-old niece, she's a lesbian. Mm. Well, that's absurd. Yeah. And even if you think, oh, that child will probably grow up gay. <laughs> yeah. So like, no one... like, like with Jess Jennings, right, as a child, as yeah. a boy. Yeah. But... But you yeah, don't then I'm reinforce that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that my mother knew. I'm sure that, you know, relatives who met me are not or were not surprised when I, when I came out. I mean, that's the irony of it. Like, you struggle with it so much yourself. <laughs> yeah. But to everybody else, it's just bloody obvious. Yes, exactly. Yeah. At what age do you think you would have been most vulnerable to getting sucked into this? And how far do you think you would have taken it? Gosh, the how far is a very, very difficult question to answer because it, it, it's speculative. Um, yeah. 
I think the the point of realization, uh, the the point when I um, felt I was most vulnerable um, was that time when I was thinking, "Oh, if only I had been born a girl." It was as the as my sexuality was kind of manifesting itself, mm-hmm. that normal point of kind of sexual awakening that um, you know everyone around me we were all going through. Um, I watched my sister, you know, having. A boyfriend one week and then you know the next week they'd have broken up and it was a tragedy and the week later there was another boy mm-hmm. just that general thing that kids do where they're figuring out how this whole attraction thing works and right. how to handle and deal with these emotions of being with someone liking someone breaking up with someone and you they practice it in this very very innocent way and i you know um I think I forget who wrote the book, The Velvet Rage. I think it was talked about there yes. that we're very good we're, book. We're Velvet denied Rage. that opportunity to figure out how to deal with these emotions, and we suddenly get thrust into this um, this world as fully sexually actualized men, but without any experience or any knowledge of how to navigate it without um, right. emotionally did um, you have any experiences as a as a teenager and by that i mean being in love with someone or someone who liked you or no i mean my memory of course is you know fancying the captain of the rugby team <laughs> it was that you know it was that sort of juvenile um very innocent i fancied my mum's aerobics yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, or or uh. or you know men on television stuff like that you, the realization that that's where arnie was you know i, I just i thought he was the underwear beautiful. section of the catalog exactly i still remember the smell of the case catalog <laughs> that paper that it was printed on and it had a very specific smell um but yeah the the, the men's underwear section of the case catalog mm. and i i was almost embarrassed to look at it just in yeah, case yeah, someone yeah. saw so and saw did i looking, linger yeah. it too too quickly right. or too too long on, on that page right. but it was yeah it, it would have been around that that time that i would have been most vulnerable because that was when i realized that the captain of the rugby team would never look at me the way that he looked at you know the, the head girl um, yeah. and you know that that wouldn't that whole interaction that I was watching my sister and you know other kids around me having with the opposite sex and that right. I, at that time I thought that will that will never happen for me I'll always be alone because why would anyone want that um, I had no idea that I hadn't even conceptualized that there were other men that are like me right. at that point um, so at, like, at that point I would have been most vulnerable and that's probably the point where most kids get access to the internet to TikTok they start to understand um, what's being said uh, on these platforms so I think at that point had I received or started to receive these messages um, I I would have found this a form of escape but I think without a doubt I would have done yeah. I think for me 13, 14 would have been yeah Around that age, yeah. Around that age. I used to have this f- fantasy, if you like, that during PE mm. I would die. Mm. And then somehow... Mm. <laughs> sort of phoenix-like... <laughs> I don't even have to say it, do I? Like some, some kind of dragon-type <laughs> supernatural... My soul would come out of my body in, in the most glorious colours and and flap around with you know in that huge physical PE hall, and everybody would go oh, and realise your beauty, <laughs> the beauty and the power. And yeah, we should have never been so mean to him. Yeah, um, I went through a, a period where I was suicidal, mm. and that was like my little. Mm-hmm. thing of how I could escape yeah was, I, yeah, was I, death and there was something that I read funnily enough in an underwear catalogue <laughs> <laughs> from many I mean I must I think I I came across it in 2000 yeah and I found it again the other day mm-hmm. and it's just an underwear catalogue but and it's just a really sexy guy right yeah. it's just one model but they tried to um, they basically came up with this stupid so-called myth 
mm. a story of how there was this valiant warrior and he was going through these <laughs> trials and obviously you do that in sexy underwear. Yeah, of course. And there was not? one page where he came to like a, a critical point in his journey as a uh -huh. hero where it's it said suicide or rebirth. Uh -huh. And that same narrative is echoed in so many of these so-called trans stories. So my option, the only option I saw available yeah. at the time was death. Yeah. But with all that gender trans stuff, uh -huh. it would have given me the option of rebirth. And then there would have been that teacher at school, at uh -huh. secondary school, who may well have said, Yes, madam. Actually, have you heard of this organization? Mm -hmm. Or we have a support group or this yeah. or that. And then the school, because they do that nowadays, the school could have transed me socially yeah. in secret without mm -hmm. telling my parents. My parents would have never gone along with it, yeah. but then I could have called them transphobes. Exactly. And in places like Canada and Australia, we've, we're, we've already seen mm -hmm. that parents can lose custody of their kids if, yeah. they, if that, they don't that affirm. That is horrific to me. Um, but I had, on, on you know, as, as you were saying, um, I had created this female persona in my right. head who was the complete antithesis of me she was this powerful confident person right um, and that was that sort of fed my my idea that you know i i should after all have been born a girl and you know this was some kind of i was some kind of aberration um was this 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 construct the powerful woman construct mm. was that can you now see there were some influences from i don't know maybe famous people on tv or or somebody that you'd seen somewhere or was it just no i fantasy? think it just came yeah it was pure fantasy it just came out of my head um it was escapism yeah escapism trying something on that was completely not mm. not who i was um, and I wasn't, you know, effective at, at being a man or being male. Uh, I wasn't a man, and I was, you know, being a boy as the way boys were meant to be. And um, would this be a, would this be more who I am rather than a boy? <laughs> I look back yeah. on it now with a mixture of horror and, and um, I don't know, it, it, I look at it, it's, it's, it's a bit ridiculous when I look back at it now. Um, as an adult, but at the same time, I'm scared about it mm. because I now, you know, today, if I had felt that, I have a greater understanding of where that could have led me, mm. and and that's what that's what terrifies me. Um, and it's actually something that you um, you said about about school. Um, what this has done, um, as Hakim. Um, calls this um was Gothmark five is yeah, his yeah. um his perspective that it's uh it's another um sort of juvenile rebellion um sort of thing. And I agree with him, you know, I think that's um that's an accurate analysis of what's happening. But I would go a step further and say that this has handed the power to the children. Yeah. In previous iterations of these youth youth subcultures, the adults always retained the power. They could say, "Look, stop being so stupid. Go and sit down. Yeah. You know, do your work." But now, as soon as a, a child turns up and says, "I'm trans," or "These are my pronouns," teachers, parents have no no ability to say, "You're being silly, dear. You'll never be a girl. Now yeah. just go and Transform. eat your dinner." Transform. Um, Big it yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, from it's all given, angles. It's given the power to the kids and the adults really have left the room. Right. And and power to the likes of the Susie Greens, the Polly yeah. Carmichaels, yeah. the Ruth Hunts. Yeah. You know, the, the ones that are not to be trusted. Yes, exactly. Really. So, I mean, I think it's interesting when you look at the word escapism because the, the opposite of escapism, I guess, is embracing. Mm -hmm. Where we've learned to embrace ourselves as we are. Yes you know, generally, through our own <laughs> trials and tribulations. <laughs> but you need to go through these things. Yeah. Well, I told and, you, I, you know, we, we've spoken about it. I, from the age of about 15, 16, I went through a very, very deliberate 
process of completely changing right the you rebirth. Know, the pers- it was, yes. I suppose you could look at it like that. I do kind of look at it like that. I changed every aspect. I, mean, I changed, you know, I cut my hair up. I fixed my teeth. I started wearing contact lenses. You know, all of this was over a period of years. I got to the university. I started going to the gym. I'd never been sporty before, but I just knew that I, you know, I didn't want to be skinny anymore. I was too scared to admit yeah. that I did actually want to be big because I always felt that was too ridiculous of a thing to say. Okay. Um, for somebody with my build who wasn't sporty at that right. time you know gyms were places like Arnold Schwarzenegger went they weren't places yeah, yeah. that I went uh, the penny hadn't dropped that everyone who was like that had to start somewhere had to start as that skinny yeah. little boy or skinny little girl or whatever it was they all started somewhere yeah. um, but that penny hadn't dropped then um, but yeah this was a very conscious rebuilding um, and transformation my own trends and <laughs> like, <laughs> were, okay so Monroe Bergdorf would say see that's a form of because he released this book right uh-huh. what, what was it called transitional or something I can't, I don't know. and basically the whole premise of the book is that everybody transitions all the time uh-huh. and that you know taking hardcore drugs yeah uh, and having extreme body modifications is just one form of yeah. the transition that we're all going through in life. Like, it's all this constant normalization of yeah. something that's absolutely not normal. Exactly. So, on the one hand, you have escapism. On the one hand, you have what I would say embrace. You yeah. embrace your sex. Yes. And you give gender the middle finger. Mm-hmm. That's where, in my opinion, true freedom and authenticity lies. Yeah. What this movement has done is they've taken the prison of gender uh-huh. and sold it as a paradise. Yeah. Yes. And I find that completely reprehensible. Yeah. And immoral mm-hmm. to pit kids and young teens against themselves yeah. and against their bodies to say that mm. puberty is the enemy and that for example for sensitive boys like us testosterone poisons us yeah and again i don't know how many of particularly if we're mm-hmm. looking at the boys how many yeah. of them have ended up like the likes of jess jennings and jackie green and this, this other guy um who went through jids or private where they're sterile Mm-hmm. They have no sexual function. They will never have an orgasm in their life as adults. Mm-hmm. Um, when they they could have grown into yeah. But heavy, instead, heavy and again, it doesn't matter that whether we're manly or not, or yeah. or who, who it could go any either way, you know, yes. or, or so many different ways. You could turn out as so many different types of men. Yeah, but there's more men. than one way of being a man. Right. Why and, should and we be stuck into, as I said before, this 1950s stereotype yeah. of what a man can be? And this, it, it imprisons straight men as well. Yeah. It imprisons all men. Everyone. You know, there, there's, there, like I said, there's no one way to be a man. Just right. leave people like, to... Even if you have a married couple, like that, that expression, the, the woman wears the trousers, mm. right? Again, that's it's, it's based on the idea that the man has to be... Yeah the i don't know what you call it the master of the house or uh, bringing home the bacon Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and now we have this new new ish phenomenon transmaxing have you heard of transmaxing no no (laughs) there's a new one on me double x okay so transmaxing is is are these guys Uh who feel like they failed as as men right and therefore they want to go down the path to become a woman not because they feel like a woman Mm -hmm. But because they're like, well, I'm a failure as a man, I'm probably better off mm-hmm. as a woman. Yeah. So that's called transmaxing. So they're maximizing the opportunities of transitioning. Uh-huh. I think for gay guys, that's t- twice as dangerous in a way. Uh-huh. Because as a gay guy, you can feel like a failure, one, as a man. Well, you start off. But then secondly... Because <laughs> you fail your family as well. You haven't lived up to the expectation of right. marrying, having children, getting you know. Right but from then, go. <laughs> as a failure, as a gay man, mm-hmm. where you don't feel accepted on the gay scene, for example. Mm-hmm. Or, like, I never felt I fit in anywhere on the gay scene. I guess I was yeah. a twink because I was skinny and pretty. But but I never felt part of it, really. I, mm-hmm. But I've always been a bit, like, you, you call yourself a bit of a loner. I've always been a bit of a 
in a way a social butterfly that I just flipped from one uh -huh. group to another and I never yeah no I was never that person I never had my own tribe yeah. as such um, so I think young gay guys are particularly vulnerable to this because one they failed as a man mm -hmm. in their perception two they failed as gay men yeah because on the gay in the gay world you get rejected for not being manly enough because mm -hmm. the gays love masculinity yes. in general you know it's a generalization yeah. but it's a big thing yeah of course um and then again that, that's why i try to man up for a bit you know mm. <laughs> i wrote a song about it <laughs> of course <laughs> to something stupid yeah so i i went um it's one of the first songs i ever did live yeah I'm not exactly straight, but all the same, I really hate it when they call me a queen. <laughs> they say it's all too clear that I'm a girly little queer at the campus they've ever seen. <laughs> I try to play it down and work real hard to manifest my masculinity. <laughs> but then I go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like, Oh my God, I love your handbag! <laughs> <laughs> you know, because yeah. you got to try and have fun with it. One of the best lines I think I've ever written. I bite my tongue when Kylie's on and hope no one can see the tears well up in my eyes. <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just a way for me to, I don't know, take the piss, but at the same time process stuff. And yeah. like, where do I fit in as a guy, as a gay guy? Mm -hmm. And well, you know, where's my lover man <laughs> gonna come from? Will anyone ever accept me as me? Yeah. And I know it sounds cliche, but you gotta accept yourself first. Mm -hmm. So if just on the off chance mm. that some of these sensitive guys may be watching this conversation, yeah. I have no idea if, if <laughs> my videos attract <laughs> them and if they'd be open to listening. Yeah. But for those 12, 13, 14 year olds who are feeling insecure, yeah. maybe even just depressed yeah. and struggling with the thought of being gay what what would you tell them or maybe what would you tell your younger son self with what you've learned now God, stick with it right give about. yourself give yourself the opportunity don't it's horrible it will be difficult but give yourself the opportunity to do it there was someone who said to me, one thing was a psychologist. Um, so my parents, when I told them, took me to see a child psychologist. No. Not, not from a... Conversion. Not, not from, absolutely not from a conversion therapy sort of perspective. It was more just to try and understand how I was feeling mm -hmm. about it. Um, and I think he, his response was, yes, yes, he's gay. Um, so he recommended that I see he was, he was a psychiatrist you know, he recommended that there was a psychologist that I could work with she was brilliant you know I, we had, I had one session with her um, and I, was, I sort of explained my, my feelings about being gay and her response was look think about it as going swimming in the ocean you leave the beach and in front of you there's this this section of all the detritus, all the sticks, the twigs, the mm. seaweed in front of you. Yeah. But just keep swimming through that and before you then you'll get to the clear blue ocean. The clear blue ocean. And that image has stuck with me. Nice. And I was and then she said, Right, that that's it. Off you go. <laughs> So it, and at the time you know, that resonated with you. Oh, absolutely. Nice. And thinking back now, at the time, it wasn't affirming my yeah. discomfort. Right. It what she was she was affirming my sense of being a gay man, and what she was saying was, "Look, it's going to be tough, but you'll get through it, and when you get through it, it'll be better." Which is the perfect cue for a Barbara Streisand song. <laughs> <laughs> Rise and look around you, and you'll see who you are. 
So now you're here, mm -hmm. and you're a grown man. Let's not go too far. <laughs> you still think you're skinny, yeah. right? <laughs> Growing all disgracefully. And now you're part of the Game as Network. Yeah. And you're pushing back against this stuff. Mm -hmm. How did it feel, especially as someone who's more introverted? Yeah. Um, and you hadn't really talked about like the, the personal side of things uh -huh. to be in the Houses of Parliament mm -hmm. and deliver your speech with knowing there was someone from the House of Lords there. Mm -hmm. There and were two people. We had an Lords. MP yeah. and then special advisors. And yeah. What was that like? Um, well, doing it was was nerve wracking mm. because I'm I'm not. Um, a public speaker and this was really the first time I had done any kind of public speaking for decades um, but after all the interactions that I'd had on Twitter about because I'd, I'd said some um, of this on, on mm -hmm. Twitter to people and the response I said was you know so many people saying you know me too that with the grace of God yeah. that sort of thing I felt there was something I had to say as a reason why I'm involved in this, a reason why yeah. I feel so strongly, what it is that motivates me to think that this is such a dangerous, poisonous idea for young people, young yeah. gay men, that telling the story of where I came from and the ideas that were in my head and how lucky I was that I wasn't exposed to this stuff at that particular point yeah. in my life, it was... To get it, to get that out to that audience was far more important. And what really um, struck me is afterwards that man from the House of Lords, or that Lord, yeah. said that he could really relate to what you said. And he said, he said it himself, that would have been mm -hmm. me. Yes. And it's, yeah. it's us now. I mean the other side they go on about lived experience so much well this is us speaking from our lived experience yeah and seeing the dangers mm -hmm. of these that, that are out there for these younger guys and the, often they ask us how does it affect you mm -hmm. how does it hurt you and i always think that's such a disingenuous question because one they don't want to hear the answer yeah if you answer they're just going to argue it and say it's none of your business but the whole premise doesn't make sense why would you only care mm -hmm. about what affects you yeah i mean is that that's you just be a raging narcissist, a selfish person. But that's that's at the the heart, I think, of gender ideology, trans ideology. Mm -hmm. um, what's being fed to uh, young people? It, it's so inward looking. Yeah, There's no obsessive, sense of, of of with the self, yeah. right? And and their own self actualization and a complete abandonment of the idea that you you get a lot of that self-actualization not by looking inward, not by this constant self-analysis and selfishness and narcissism, but looking out into the world, yeah. helping other people, seeing the, the challenges that other people are facing Very and important. perhaps seeing you in those and finding empathy. Where has empathy gone in the discussion? Yeah. Um, it's, it's only empathy when they need it, right? Yeah. People and expect empathy from others, but there doesn't seem to be a sense of wanting right, to give it. But it's, it's like a demand for empathy. Yeah. And uh, what was I going to say? I mean, I'm all for, you know, step back, try to look at things objectively and analyze things. But as I say, you step back, whereas what they do, they, they dive into something. Yeah. They don't have the perspective. Yeah. It's all about this me, 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 yeah. me. And I think that's just something that's slipped into the culture since maybe the eighties, you know, mm. that all in the eighties it was more about you get what you what you can yeah. and I don't know, it's it's just become over time more the therapy self speak that self absorbed. That yes, and yes. I mean I've had therapy and for me therapy was mm. very useful at the time yeah. when I had it. Um but I think it's it's kinda of gone completely mm. that way where it's all about analyzing every tiny single yeah, thing like I said, it's a it's a constant self analysis. and it has to fit in with this this form of identity that is your authentic self and 
everybody's expected to to recognize it, go along with it, mm -hmm. or question it, blah blah blah. Um, with the the publication of the CAS review, mm -hmm. and with the UK government now having said no to a conversion therapy ban, mm -hmm. um, obviously in in Scotland that's still yeah. Well, the Conservative government have said no to a conversion therapy ban. In but Scotland? No, in, in Oh, England, in the UK, yeah. Again, a Labour government could bring it in. Yeah, exactly. So. We're, we're facing a general election, <sighs> which the Conservatives are going to lose. Um, so we have no idea what the Labour government are going to do. And that terrifies me. Which is why we have to stay on We have the to ball. stay focused, yeah. And that's obviously the reason why Gay Men's Network exists, yeah. because we look at all the legislation that's being tabled, then we... Mm -hmm we put in our um, consultation responses, which are very detailed and always very much focused on yeah. this whole idea of is this legislation actually yeah, it's pushing, -based. transing away the gay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's wrap it up. This, okay. Where do you, how do you feel now that the CAS review has been published and it's only just been out, but it's mm -hmm. already pretty obvious it's it's like a bombshell yeah yeah it'll probably take a while for others to catch up with it mm -hmm. and and what's being pushed to these kids in, in schools and mm -hmm. through the media but how do you feel about are, there, are things shifting are they changing is there hope well i think we all hope that they are um I think I think there is hope um, because the, this level of abandonment of reason and enlightenment values can can't go on. It can't simply can't take hold. I think, um, but I mean it, it's it's tragic what's happened to all the young people who have been caught up in this. All these young people who mm. were struggling with their internalized homophobia with other mental health problems that were simply ignored or pushed to one side and not addressed once you know the, the trans right. thing was mentioned and all these treatments treatments interventions they yeah. had, they haven't sorted out these things exactly like there was one um i forget his name but this was maybe 2006 that he started mm. going on the blockers yeah um it's just a, about a year after jackie green yeah went down that road uh so this is a british guy and he was super girly. Yeah. He got bullied relentlessly for it. And of course I was constantly tormented as a child for being the gay boy and being the freak and the weirdo that no one wanted to go near. And it kept on taking its toll. So this is where I can see, wait a second, this really mirrors my experience, yeah. but a few decades that's the later. Thing with, yeah, that's, every one of us can see ourselves in all of those kids. And that yes. that's the powerful thing that, that you know, I, I said in, in, in what I was talking about in the House of Lords, what I saw on Twitter is that all of us look at that and we see ourselves. I see myself in these little boys and that's what terrifies me. And that is a tragedy. However, the, the publication of the CAS review, um, the tribunal, um, Alison Bailey's tribunal, mm -hmm. um, Mermaids trying to sue LGB Alliance. And strip them off charity the status. Charitable status. Yeah, that failed. All of these things have progressively forced this nonsense into the public eye. Yes. They've made the, the mainstream media, um, major newspapers have picked it up. Um, and now with the cast review, the media's just gone, gone crazy. So this idea is landing on the breakfast tables yes. of... Your regular people outside of the London metropolitan -y bubble who, you know, will always kind of gravitate towards this kind of nonsense. People are beginning to realise what's being done to young people, what this um, ideology really means, yeah. the complete detachment from any kind of objective reality. Yeah, and common that's, sense. That's required to to buy into this so that to me is the saving grace of the cast review and all of these um all these things that have happened is that the light has finally been shone on yeah. what we've been fighting for so long 
and mm. everyone can now see it for yeah. the lies and the, the the terrible thing that it actually is. Yeah, and I'm now seeing calls for a reckoning, if you like, for yeah. people to be held accountable. Yes. There was a petition yeah. to now strip Ruth Hunt of her yeah. peerage, yeah. Exactly. Uh, which I'm all for. I think the danger is, even now they've said they're no longer going to prescribe mm. puberty blockers. Yeah. The ones who were <coughs> already referred to them can still go on them, even mm -hmm. though they haven't started them. Yeah. Um, obviously, the private providers are going to try and capture as many of them as, as they can, like yeah. the Helen Webberley. So unless the government steps in and, and puts things in place to, mm -hmm. to stop them from doing that. My, I think it's, it's going to happen anyway. There's going to be another, there's going to be truckloads of other young young girls but obviously for us we're particularly concerned in this context yeah. about the young guys who are gonna suffer from this um and especially and then we're just talking about the uk then mm -hmm. then there's australia then there's yeah. the united states and canada and canada. <coughs> and canada but i guess your message was stick with it write it out and get yeah. to the clear get, blue ocean get through the crap and the rubbish and the seaweed and the detritus and you know you'll you'll get there in the end yeah and like just and to you get can back to, have a, a full life yes and like just to get back to that young guy that i mentioned i mean he was on the blockers puberty blockers were not available on the nhs at the time for those under 16. after contacting mermaids which had susie green on the team his parents took him to the states to halt his puberty just as Susie Green had done, his parents remortgaged their house and used other funds to be able to afford the drugs and regular trips to the States. And I'm so beyond grateful to my parents. They remortgaged their house, they put all of their savings and investments into making sure that their child was medicated. He was also in a psych ward for a while. Mm -hmm. For a whole year, when he was only 14. And while he was in the psych ward, they kept him on, on the blockers. Right. And it's like, are you mad? Yeah. Um, this this guy obviously had serious issues. Yeah. Then he went on estrogen, and as soon as he was 18, he had his um, penis <laughs> surgically inverted. Yeah. And he's in his early 20s now. He thinks of himself as a woman. Mm -hmm. I am a normal girl. He now works in marketing, and he's never gone through male puberty or yeah. through his puberty yeah. so uh, he's, he has a very high voice because his voice never broke yeah so i think this is is, is a case of yeah a well guy. That, that if you remember that that's how they created the the, the original counter tenors with the castrati the yeah balls off. Their, balls off. <laughs> their voice never so, broke <coughs> and i i saw a video of him and because what he, what he now likes to do is he, he likes to do drag uh -huh. so he he has a youtube channel and he does drag videos <laughs> Cause each time I see you, I break down and cry. And I'm like, you're just a flamboyant gay yeah. guy, but yeah. you've been sterilized. Mm -hmm. You will never have an orgasm in your life. Yeah. And when we mention this, they go, oh my God, you're a pervert. You're thinking about people having orgasms. And it's yeah. like, have you had an orgasm? Yeah. Do you know how amazing it is? Like, yeah. why would you take that away from someone to experience yeah. that throughout for a lifetime? He, and then I saw him, because again with him his mom was really supportive and as soon as you know he needed help the first place that she went to for advice was mermaids mm -hmm. now she's an activist for mermaids yeah. so it's like the whole family becomes an activist there is no chance that this guy ever had no. to just go do you know what i'm just a gay guy just it's find fun. out his own way of being a man and whatever that looked like when whatever I, that was for him right like, which could have been any type yeah. of man. It doesn't like it, it. Doesn't have to be anything like you. It doesn't have to be anything like me. Exactly. It just be your own um, kind of man. Own man. He missed that. But in that video, when his mum joined him, because mm -hmm. first I thought, well, okay, I don't think I could have, I would have been able to tell that he was he was male. Yeah. Because, you know, mm -hmm. his voice and the way he looks. But then his mum stood next to him. Right. And suddenly it was obvious. obvious. Yeah. And what's worse for this guy? Living a lie for the rest of his life? Mm -hmm. I don't think any choice now. Or realizing, oops, mm -hmm. 
I, I think the oops would just be too much. Far too much. So, give it time. Yeah. Give it time. Yeah. Find the clear blue ocean. <laughs> and time doesn't mean a couple of months. It yeah. doesn't mean even one or two years. Give yourself time. I'm saying, oh, it's give yourself a lifetime. Yeah. And because it, it can take years, but it's so worth it when you get yeah. to that point where, and plenty of people don't get there, yeah. no matter if they're gay or the, straight. The, the deeply frustrating, sort of, sort of, but the deeply frustrating part about um, what gender has done to gay people gay men, lesbians. What, this happened, what, 2015? It started to take hold, really? Well, the trans child was sort of invented late 90s. Yeah. The Americans started going crazy with the medication around 2004-ish. Mm -hmm. And then it just... It just went... Escalated from there in terms yeah. of with the, the smartphones and the internet yeah. and the media exposure. But, you know, we, we'd achieved gay marriage by... 2015 or so, mm. you know, we had full equality. There's really no better place in the world to be gay than in the UK. We could, we we could live absolutely full lives. Yeah, we'd done it. Young people could come out with no, or at least far less opprobrium than we had faced. More role models. Role mod positive. Positive role ones. models. And representations where it's just... It we weren't punchlines or AIDS victims anymore. Right. And genders just wiped that all away. And... And gender... And that makes me so sad. It, and it paints us as the baddies. Yeah. When we're the ones saying There's something very dangerous here. Yeah. Yeah. When we're saying just, just grow up. Grow yeah. up. Give, give yourself, give a, yourself a chance to grow up. Yeah. That's it. Grow up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you, Mello. Well, thank you. Thank you for being so open about it. Pleasure. Um, it's an important thing to talk about. I think so. And it's it's something that registers. I've noticed that. That's what I've We saw that with the guy from the House of Lords. Yeah. It's when they go, that could have been me. That yes. really hits home. Oh, yeah. I still get emotional when I look at look back at tweets that I've written, in, you know, in that vein, and the number of gay men and lesbians who piped up saying, "Yeah, that could be me." I find that that quite hard to read sometimes. Yes, yeah. it's, and it's good to know that 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 others see that and that others yeah. are talking about that now. Yeah, and absolutely. obviously, one person that recognises this and supports us in what we do. Mm is J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Who liked how many tweets of you? <laughs> five. Five. So J.K. Rowling liked about five of his tweets this morning. She liked two of mine. Yeah. Although she did once pick me up for spending whiskey with an E, which I will never, ever live down all my life. Okay. Shame on you. I know. Just when you get over your gay shame, you get that thrown in your face. <laughs> yeah. I think that will forever be, yeah, I, I will never, ever live that down. So, and yesterday, uh, J.K. Rowling <laughs> responded to one of my tweets and saying, uh, I love you, Mr. Minno, but you know that. So. <laughs> Sorry, that was my manly shoulder. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you all for watching. Thanks. Um, if you think this was an important conversation, then please share it. Uh, yep. Share it with others. Um, like, subscribe. Yes. And follow us on Twitter. Follow us. I mean, yep. um, the, the gay men's. Oh, I just looked at gay a bird shitting. That yeah. was lovely. <laughs> <sighs> Nature. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching. And I'll see you in the next video. Ciao. Bye. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to my PayPal and Patreon supporters. Because of you, I can make videos like this. Special shout out to my big spenders. Help her open, Mama Turf and the Turventines, Me Julie, The Lovely Mary, Julia, Dusty, Judels, Leffy, Dorothy, Wildfire, Esther and Martha. Thank you.
nice to have a bit of green in there. Yeah. And you look fucking massive. Oh, that's good. I mean, I'm not going to complain about that. No. <laughs> and I look like a, a witch. <laughs>